Mortality at first glance, the second major demographic factor, is relatively simple. It's expressed as the death rate, the number of people who die per 1,000 in a given year. And yet, it's not actually that simple. Um, because if we compare the death rates between different countries, it doesn't actually tell us much about the health of a population. It tells us more, in some instances, about the age structure of the population. So let me make that a little bit clearer. Japan has a very high death rate. Now, does this mean that Japan is a very unhealthy society? Absolutely not. Japan has a high death rate because Japan has a lot of old people. So if you as a society are a very healthy society where many people live to be quite old, your death rate is gonna be relatively high because you have a lot of old people. So the death rate doesn't necessarily tell us everything that we need to know about um, uh, 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 the health of a society. The United States is gonna have a high death rate over the next 20 years, 25 years. Why? because we had a baby boom. There were a bunch of people who were born and a lot of those people are aging through society and that large group of people are about to start dying. It may seem cold to say that, but you know they're getting to be at the age where people die. And so we can expect them to start dying. And so we'll see an increase in the US death rate. That doesn't necessarily mean that the United States is less healthy. It just means that the age structure of a society reflects that increased death. Better than the death rate is the life expectancy at birth. And life expectancy doesn't really mean probably what you think you mean. The life expectancy refers to how long on average we can expect people to live at birth. So um, that doesn't mean that we can expect kids born this year to leave to be 77. It means that if we averaged all the ages of the children born this year, we would get the number 77. So let me try and make this also a little bit clear. Every year that you live, your life expectancy goes up. How is that possible? Well, your life expectancy is the expectancy, how long you're likely to live among the cohort of people that were born. So I was born in 1978. So there are many people who were born in 1978 who are now dead. And insofar as they are dead, they are like below the average life expectancy. And so for the rest of us who are still alive, our life expectancy is increasing in part because we didn't die in the last year. So life expectancy is not how long I can expect to live. It's how long people born on average the year that I was born can expect to live. So the life expectancy for you know, people born 77 years ago is 77. Um, but actually, they can expect to live much longer. If you live to 80, you're more likely to live to 81. And there were many people who lived to 80 in the same year that you were born, who recently died. So therefore, you, your life expectancy keeps increasing. This is sort of a curious um, uh, phenomenon. It's actually not that curious, but uh, hopefully it's a little bit clearer to you. But what I want you to see is that the life expectancy is a good indicator of the average health of a person born in a particular year, and is typically a better indicator of the health of the system. In 1990, the world life expectancy was 30, which is quite low, and today it's 72. That's 74 for men and 70 for, I mean, 74 for women, excuse me, and 70 for men. And um, this is part, not all, but part of our increasing population. So in 1990, um, uh, the population, you know, was high in part because lots of people were being born, but many of them died by the age of 30. Today, our population is high, not necessarily because our fertility rate is super high, but because our death rate is lower. So more people are living for longer periods of time, which increases our population. So the average, the life expectancy today in the world of 72 is reflective. Why is it that the life expectancy has changed? Well, um, a huge factor of this is improvements in personal hygiene and public health practices. So some of it is knowledge of diseases and the capacity to treat diseases, things like antibiotics, um, some surgical interventions, et cetera. 
but mostly it's people have access to clean water and they're not dying from things like um, polluted water and that their personal hygiene practices like washing their hands has increased. And so public health has been essential to the increase in the life expectancy of the world. We don't really expect the world's life expectancy to increase above at 85. That seems like it'll be the maximal human life expectancy of a society, and no society has really gotten there so far. Now, when we look at mortality, um, and many demographers look at things like race and ethnicity because it is a significant indicator of racial inequality. Racial and ethnic minorities often have lower life expectancy. So the life expectancy for African Americans in the United States is 70, and for whites it's 77. And so whites live for 10% longer on average than blacks do. And black males have this particularly bad. So in Harlem in the 80s, as the slide says, African American men only had a 40% chance of reaching the age of 65. That's lower than the chance of men in Bangladesh, one of the world's poorest nations. And socioeconomic status explains some, but not all of this. Our social programs, public health services, and medical investments go more to helping whites than they do to blacks, and we'll see more about this later. But one of the ways that we can clearly, clearly see racial inequalities in a country is to look at the differences between groups in their mortality. You could also look at this relative to um, uh, immigrants or a socioeconomic status. In virtually every society, rich people live longer than poor people. And that is a strong, strong indicator of the impacts of inequality on people's lives, literally on their lives, meaning that poor people die younger than rich people. Sociologists, people like me, think that inequality is a problem and that we should do something about it. Um, uh, and, and, and so like, you know, it kind of makes me mad. I say insert rent here, I'm not going to. But where the socioeconomic gaps tend to be the largest is in childhood. And this means that ch poor children are much more likely to die than rich children. Children under the ages of two among poor people are much more likely to die. Um, and poor children in the United States have a much higher mortality rate than rich children in the United States. And this is particularly even more acute among African-American children. And they'd be better off actually if they lived in just about any other industrialized country in the world in terms of their life expectancy. It might be the first time you've heard that, but you should realize that the death rate among African-American children is incredibly high, far, far higher than it is on average for the death rate of children in just about any other industrialized country and that this is partially driven by race and it's partially driven by class, but it is a huge, huge indicator of inequality.